Hills and Valleys is a podcast that uncovers stories from leaders in healthcare, tech, and everything in between. Straight from the heart of Silicon Valley, we give you a look at the good, the bad, and the future, one episode at a time. Brought to you by Petro Medical. Hey everyone, Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth here at Petro Medical, and we have a fantastic episode for you, as always, of Hills and Valleys. Now, this week we caught up with Dr. Natalia Ivascu, who is the Associate Professor of Clinical Anesthesiologist at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. Now, she cares for patients as a cardiac anesthesiologist and critical care intensivist, and also serves as the Director of the Cardiothoracic Surgical Intensive Care Unit. Now, we not only cover her her story in terms of why she got into medicine and how she became an anesthesiologist, but on the clinical side, the importance of fluid management. You see, patients who are in cardiac surgery have a variety of different monitoring uh, technologies hooked up to them, and of course, because you're operating on the heart, fluid management is of the utmost importance. So we talk about that, and more specifically, end organ perfusion, and how urine output gives you not only a great idea of the perfusion of the kidney, but a better hint of what's going on upstream with the rest of the organs. So sit back and enjoy this week's episode of Hills and Valleys. Hi everyone, uh, Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth over Petrero Medical, and we're in Chicago at the Fantastic Society of Cardiac Anesthesiology Meeting, and we're joined by Dr. Natalia Ivascu. Thanks for uh, spending some time with us. You've been quite a popular person. It's hard to get a hold of you, so I'm glad we're able to get you for a little bit. So welcome. Thank you, Omar. I'm really pleased to have a chance to talk to you, too. Great. So, you know, look, before we, you know, jump into things, you know, tell us a little about yourself. You know, where where'd you go to, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to med school? And I mean, how did you go from Natalia Vasco to Dr. Natalia Vasco? Well, um, I grew up in the Detroit area. Um, my family is of Romanian origin. Um, my father was an immigrant when he was 12. And um, my mother was um, born in the Detroit area also, but her parents are, are two Romanian. Um, so we grew up in sort of that community and um, went to University of Michigan for undergrad. So that was as far as I had. Go blue, right? Go blue, absolutely. <laughs> um, and um, from there, I decided kind of midway through college to pursue medicine and um, applied to medical school. So I first got into Georgetown, and the first thing out of my mother's vo- mouth was, this doesn't mean you can't go to Wayne State, right? Which is where my sister was in medical school um, in the Detroit area, in, in Detroit. So I, um, I ended up also um, being admitted to Wayne State, and it ended up being um, really the best decision ever. Um, so I went to medical school there, not so far from home. Um, it was a really economical choice, and especially now with all the pressure on physicians um, dealing with postgraduate debt, mm. I was really pleased that I chose a state school in the end. I, um, from there, applied to residency. I knew I wanted to go to a city. Um, get further than 45 miles from home, which is as far as I had really gotten Always a good up to idea, that point. Right? <laughs> and I uh, really fell in love with New York when I came to do interviews and um, uh, chose Weill well, Cornell um, New York Hospital at the time to, um, to do my residency. Um, I picked it in part because I knew I wanted to do cardiac anesthesia, and they had a really strong department of cardiac surgery and cardiac anesthesia division within the Department of Anesthesiology. So um, I stayed there for my fellowship in cardiac anesthesia, and then I ended up deciding to pursue critical care. Um, I spent a year at our sister institution of New York Presbyterian, uh, which is Columbia University, uptown, did critical care, and then resumed um, my practice at Cornell, and I have been on faculty for 12 years. Fantastic. Now, I gotta gotta ask, I gotta go back a little bit. So you said that halfway through college, you just decided to become pre-med. So (laughs) What did you start out thinking you were going to do, and what made you change? Um, well, I thought I would be a lawyer, and um, even in our pre-conversation, you picked up that I like to talk, and uh, it's pretty easy for me to have conversations, so I guess that was um, my general impression of what I might go into. Um, the, the turning point was um, I had a lot of friends that were pre-med. Everyone comes into college, or lots of people come into college pre-med. I feel like everyone starts out either pre-med or pre-law in yes, college, but like very few right. actually stick it stick it out. And you know, even though I had been a really strong student, um, I had such a, I kind of really held physicians on such a high pedestal. We didn't have doctors in my family. It was just something so important, and so I just I think I had the pre- the the impression that well maybe I'm not smart enough to do that, and. Um, 
my uh, uh, sophomore year of college, I took organic chemistry, as everyone does, and it's the, a real weeder course, as they say. That's definitely a weeder course, med. yeah. And the first exam, I did totally average, and I was like, oh, I can't believe this. So, like, you know, um, I, I uh, went to office hours. I became really interested in biochemistry. I was like, I'm going to master this. And um, I did great on the next exam. And after that, I had sort of figured out organic chemistry. And I ended up getting an A+. Plus. And, it, like, I didn't know that A+, pluses existed in college. And um, so as a result, um, I decided maybe I'm smart enough to go into medicine and um, ended up heading that way. Very nice. I'm going to edit this part out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know he's going to talk to me. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, you know, that's the benefit about being at these conferences is that people come by and say hi to you and everything. That's, that's I don't think it. I'm going to edit this part out. I think it's good. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Well, you know, it, that's an old friend that was, uh, was at Columbia when I was a fellow. And okay, cool. So that was 13 years ago. And really, we've never worked together since. But we see each other at conferences. And he's actually now in UCLA on the other end of the... Uh, country and you're right. The conferences are so great with networking and, and making connections um, that you just wouldn't have. It's still worth making the trips and coming in person. Nice. And so, when you were in medical school, I mean, what did what what made you say, "Hey, you know, I'm going to go into critical care"? Well, you know, I um, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to pursue. Um, I feel like the first decision in choosing a medical specialty is deciding if you like clinic work or hospital work. Because they're really very different jobs. You know, I always think it's interesting that, especially those of us that went into medicine that didn't have family members in the field, have a very glossed over view of the idea of the profession. I Meaning, yeah. we think like all doctors are doctors, like it's all the same job, but there's a huge difference. You know, pediatrician and a radiation oncologist and a, a general surgeon, like those jobs are completely impossible to see as the same kind of a job. They have different hours, different responsibilities, different pressures. Um, and, you know, it's just uh, something that I didn't really appreciate until I was doing my clinical rotations. So I, um, I quickly realized that I, I liked being in the hospital. I liked the intensity of it. I liked the organization of it, I think, in particular. And, I, and most of all, I think I like the team work. I think being alone in a clinic just doesn't suit my personality. I'm a more of an extrovert, teamwork kind of a person. So, um, so I like that. And so um, being in the hospital is going to you know, lend yourself to being in, in the surgical half of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Hospitals really divided in half between medicine and surgery. Right. And um, many times the two don't meet. I mean, people in medicine may never encounter the, what's happening in the surgical um, corner of the world. And the most organized and the most um, predictable in terms of day-to-day um, -day operations is really in the surgical side. So that kind of kind of spoke to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then from there, I wasn't quite sure. My sister was a year ahead of me in medical school, and she actually is a um, trauma surgeon. She does uh, trauma surgery and critical care. And, um, you know, I sort of saw similarities and differences in our personalities. In any case, I, I considered surgery, um, but ultimately I think I just wasn't quite, well, to be perfectly honest, I think the, the one thing that bothered me the most about surgery is that some patients were going to have complications, and they were going to be at my hand. And that's just an interesting thing about surgery. Um, you know, patients get diseases. We try to give them treatment, medical treatment, surgical treatment. And when medical treatment doesn't work out well, you usually think to yourself, what happened to the patient? What did their disease do? But on the surgical side of the world, when something doesn't happen, when the treatment doesn't necessarily give the results we're hoping for, the first instinct is, what did you do? What, did, what was done wrong? Mm -hmm. And I think I just had that fear of sort of being in that position of thinking someone you know, didn't do as well as they could have at my hand. And I thought, I think I'm better being part of the team than, mm -hmm. than having that role on the team. And I found anesthesiology, and I sort of stumbled into it. Um, we didn't have a formal rotation even in my medical school that was required. So I stumbled into it. We had a really great pediatric anesthesiologist. She was known for sort of finding people that might be interested in, in anesthesia and encouraging them um, when we were on our surgical rotations. So we'd be in the operating room. If you came early, she'd kind of help you walk you through the anesthetic um, care and help you participate in it, and it sort of sparked that interest. And she, did she serve as a, as a mentor for you? A little bit. Um, you know, she she just, and actually other anesthesiologists too, when I was on surgery, 
they were always the doctors saying like, oh, you should do this job. It's much better than the surgical job. So um, in general, I found they were seemed like happy people. Um, and, and then I did a rotation in cardiac anesthesiology as an elective in my fourth year. And that's where I really solidified this is what I wanted to do. Not just anesthesiology, but cardiac anesthesia in particular. Um, because there was a lot more to it than just the anesthesia. There's, um, it's a very high stakes environment. High stakes environment. Um, lots of procedures. So lots of, um, we place a, an arterial line to measure the blood pressure, a line in the neck to be able to monitor um, the heart pressures as well as given uh, medications. Um, and then the transesophageal echo. And that's mm. something that became um, really, it's such a particular role for the anesthesiologist in that we provide this intraoperative um, examination that gives information to the surgeon that either um, solidifies or finds new information related to the cardiac disease. Um, we often get better pictures if they only had a transthoracic echo preoperatively, the transesophageal echo being that the probe is in the esophagus right next to the heart. We get much um, more detailed um, and sharper pictures so we can understand the pathology better. Um, and th there was a clear dynamic of, of teamwork and partnership so that the anesthesiologist role I felt in the cardiac OR was different than what I observed in the general OR where they seemed to be much more siloed. Uh, in the cardiac room, there was a lot more interaction and involvement between the team because what we were finding on the TEE was important for the surgeon to make um, surgical decisions. And then after the surgical repair, there needed to be some evaluation to make sure that it was adequate and so forth. So there was a lot of give and take and conversation about the management. Yeah, and at least, you know, from my times that I've, I've gone and stepped into cases, like in cardiac cases, I mean, between the anesthesiologist and the surgeon, I mean, it, it's... If there's anything that is an analogy for a grand symphony, I feel like the cardiac OR really is I between love that. the perfusion team, the surgical team, with the anesthesiology uh, team, nursing. Doing, mm -hmm. uh, nursing. It's, I mean, it's it's insane. And the other thing I've noticed, and especially coming from Silicon Valley uh, as a technologist, is that I don't think much has changed from a picture of a critical care room in the '70s till now, hmm. and I don't think much has changed in the cardiac OR till now. Because like <laughs> while I'm walking. I have to either be looking down so I don't trip on anything or looking up so I don't run into anything. So there's a lot of stuff yeah, going on. a lot of stuff going on. Um, there are, um, there's some, um, oh, more, visitors, more visitors, more visitors. <laughs> um, there are um, definitely some improvements. The tech, like all technology, there's, there's growth. And, um, and so maybe we're using similar equipment, but it's better equipment. Um, mm. We were just joking actually um, yesterday about how the TE machines, like when I was a resident, someone asked me, like, do you remember when there was a VCR tape? And I was like, yeah, that's how it was when I was in training, that you had to record the echo. Um, not, there was no digital recording of it. So you put in the VCR tape, and you recorded all of your clips live. And it just was a VCR tape. You can go play it on the VCR to, to review it. So your Radio Shack could have been a medical device company. They just thought about <laughs> it the right, right way. Exactly. Um, now it's all, of course, digital clips, and the processors are amazing, and we can do all these technologies we couldn't do. And when we first changed to just the VCR level to like the next generation, I remember it was so frustrating to go back because I used to say I have to slow my brain down to be able to use this machine because the, the rate at which you could take pictures was so much slower. You'd get this sort of choppy picture as opposed to a really nice continuous fluid mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the quality's improved and some of the technology has improved in that way. Um, there are some differences in what's happening in the, in the critical care environment in that we're doing all we're doing more things. We have more ways to keep people going. And mm -hmm. one thing I think we are struggling with um, in, in cardiac surgery, cardiac anesthesia, cardiac critical care is finding that that right the right line of finding mm -hmm. where what is what's heroic that's likely to have a good outcome and what's heroic that's probably not. Mm -hmm. And so where is the line of too much? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I want to. I wanted to ask you, you. You gave a lecture on it, and it's a very interesting time. But about training residents, especially with transesophageal uh, uh, echo. But you know, can, can you dive into a little bit about that? About 
having the residents and the ethics around training them with, of course, the third party being the patient? Yeah. So, um, you know, I really love being an academic anesthesiologist because we get a chance to work with trainees and they challenge you, they come up with new ideas. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to having them around the care of a patient, but there's some challenges that we have to think of as well. Um, you know, we can, we can justify training by saying there is some added benefit, like you have another person involved, there's a, they are another set of eyes, they may find things that no one else noticed, they're another um, you know, skilled, skilled person or at least ed somewhat educated person involved. There's also um, the um, uh, the ability for the attending senior person to be in more places at once. You can expand care in that way. So having um, having trainees can improve care for more patients or allow care for more patients. Um, so there's you know some plus sides, but the the thing that we have to keep in mind is is two part. One is making sure that the things we um, teach residents that especially the, the technical tasks, the invasive procedures, that we do it in a way that is, number one, um, appropriate. So the task needs to be appropriate to the level of the, the resident. It also needs to be appropriate to the preparation that they've made. So um, simulation is something that's changed a lot of the way we train residents. We don't have to literally, we used to say, see one, do one, teach one. This, you know, the saying in medicine, and it was quite literal <laughs> in a lot of ways, um, which is, from a patient's perspective, I'm sure it's horrifying that you literally would see a procedure, then you do a procedure, and then all of a sudden you're the teacher, but it was pretty close to that. Um, and now we have, you know, wonderful simulation that allows us to be able to um, bring learners along to learning basic tasks so that when they get to the patient, it really isn't the first time they're doing it. Maybe everyone's going to have the first time they're doing it for real on a real person, but they've had appropriate ex exposure and appropriate experience on a, in a training situation that they have the, the correct knowledge and they have some dexterity and some, some ma manual um, ability that makes it that much safer. So transesophageal echo is something that's um, kind of unique to our specialty in terms of intraoperative teaching um, because it, mo it exists in a couple of other areas like um, um, transplant, liver transplant in particular has a high use of, of intraoperative echo and some other surgeries may use intraoperative echo but on a routine basis if you wanted to learn transesophageal echocardiography you'd go to the heart room because that's mm. where it's being used every day. So it's um, an opportunity for education and again um, you know I think um, it's, a, it's a good place to be able to teach this but I think of it like um, a student driver. So um, if you're going to get into the car with a student driver, the student has to learn, but it's a safe environment because there's an expert right next to them. They have their foot on the safety brake. They can kind of control the situation. But, and that's you know, probably okay if the passenger has to get where they're going anyway. So if this is a way for that passenger to get from point A to point B, then that's, I think, a really justifiable way to say, okay, you have to get there. We're going to take you there. But we're going to, in this very safe environment, with appropriate safety net, we're going to let this other person have their hands at the wheel, who's who's not yet the expert on the on the path, you know, the right side of the <laughs> the front seat, um, mm. but but ready to has appropriate you know level of training to start driving. What's tricky is when we use opportunities um, of of convenience, and the passenger, let me use the analogy, the passenger doesn't actually need to make the trip. So it, you can justify that maybe it's not quite as safe with a student driver as it would be if the expert was in the driver's seat. But they have to get there anyway. So it's okay because they're still going to get there. They're going to get there reasonably safely, so it's justifiable. But is it just as justifiable to take a passenger and expose them to that risk if they don't need to be in the car at all? And that's where we have to kind of find that fine line. So it's something that, um, that we, we talk about and try to examine is... Um, where is that appropriate level? And it's something tricky for us in, in the cardiac OR because it's not clear when you cross that line. So, um, for example, we do a lot of invasive procedures, as I mentioned. And I typically let my resident do those procedures um, or make the first attempt at it, anyhow. And um, I can justify it based on all the things that we've talked about. I'm right there watching, making sure nothing's happening I'm not comfortable with. Um, and that the echo is similar. So when we have cardiac fellows, for example, and it's time to do the exam, they may have their hands on the wheel, but I'm right there next to them, directing, making sure that we're doing the appropriate clips and that they're mm -hmm. manipulating the probe safely. What's, what's uh, a, a tricky part is that there might be an opportunity there, since the patient's anesthetized, the probe stays in place throughout surgery, maybe we could have another person also do a practice exam 
because after all, we might find something else. Um, we're going to see what else we can see, and they're anesthetized anyway. The probe's there anyway. Why not? Well, I've kind of given you some of the reasons why not already. I sort of uh, maybe put that ahead of the of the question, but um, that's where it can be really easy to not realize you've crossed that line mm -hmm. because it's just like any other part of education, right? We let the trainees be involved in and all these other elements, why is this different? Mm -hmm. And and when is it different? Because maybe they'll stumble on something. Maybe we'll see something while the next person's doing the, the examination, repeating the exam that we didn't see the first time around. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I don't think it's a black and white um, answer, but it's something I think we need to be aware of and something we need to talk to patients about. And that's where the ethics of this comes in. You know, we we live in a society where we we prize autonomy, the ability to decide what will happen to one's body. All right. I know of right. late that's become uh, somewhat in question in some states in this country, but sure. generally speaking, yeah. <laughs> you are allowed to decide what is going to happen to your body. Now, one thing you know I was going to ask is that you know, uh, in the last few decades, it seems that there's been sort of an explosion with technology, and, and it's, a, it's a good thing in the sense that there's better solutions to approach problems in, in medicine. The problem, though, is that it's kind of like a few centuries ago when someone discovered the microscope and looked at it, the water droplet and said, oh my god, there's like millions of organisms in here. So now with data and technology, there are new problems that are surfacing and in some ways they're solving certain things, but on the other side it's complicating a lot of things. How does this affect the way you train, train residents? Well, you know, it just can be an overwhelming environment for residents. Um, so in particular, it makes me think of um, working in the, in the ICU, where there's a tremendous amount of data that comes up on patients every single day that we have to consider, whether it's laboratory data, radiographic data, and the x-rays, EKGs, um, trends on their urine output, um, patterns on their, um, their heart pressures, um, other markers of their cardiac performance. And, you know, um, it, it's a lot to manage for people who do it all the time. But it's even harder to manage when you have rotating residents who are going to be every month or every couple months a new resident coming in that hasn't maybe ever been there before. And so it's this perpetual state of orientation. So you have to orient. It is a little bit subspecialized from what they do in other areas. So that's something that poses somewhat of a challenge to us. Um, and I do think um, it, there's um, limited great solutions. One is to have um, advanced practice providers like physician assistants and nurse practitioners that are there on a more regular basis who would have more of the quote-unquote usual routine in mind. Mm -hmm. um, the, the downside there is that you lose the physician input. You do have a different type of training for those providers, so there might be some issues um, or might be some advantages and disadvantages to that sort of model. But that's where I, I do hope that the burgeoning um, artificial intelligence and predictive technologies, I do hope, that are going to be really significant in the ICU in particular. Because trends are really important. And um, you can get kind of caught up in, in the, the fog of war, so to speak. You can kind of get caught up in all the things happening that you could easily lose sight. And it's that, it's that subtle trend that, um, that I think is, is most important for patients. Mm -hmm. uh, we always, you know, a lot of people joke about being a black cloud. And there is some truth to the fact that you, everyone's a, more of a black cloud when they're a junior. And the truth is, you just don't see it coming. And as you become more and more senior, your cloud gets more, it gets less and less dark <laughs> because you are more likely to sort of see things coming. You have experience, you have that instinct. And so um, uh, I think it could be very useful in terms of streamlining and, and making it a little bit more um, standardized. Interesting. You know, uh, on the topic of intuition, you know, we, we checked out Dr. Uh, Perry at the University of Minnesota. He had a talk on the use of technology and how that could help essentially free physicians up so they can get back to utilizing more of their intuition. You know, and it seems that with all this technology and data points that you have no choice but to start using your intuition to pay attention to what's important at that moment because there's so many mm -hmm. different inputs. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you decide what to... What to rank as more important than something else with all these data points and especially in, in, the, in the cardiac suite with all these different uh, monitors going yeah. on. Well, you know, it's, um, it's something I actually like to really emphasize with the residents is that the very essence of being a doctor is making the diagnosis and it's not fixing the numbers. So it's something with all the input coming in, it's 
and the electronic medical record is another big driver because so much of a resident's life is chained to the computer to enter orders, modify orders, discharge orders, re reinstitute orders. It, it, each time, each click, it's, it does take a large portion of their day. So there's this urgency, there's this hate urgency when there's something wrong, like let's say the patient's um, blood pressure is low. There's an urgency to quick add some blood pressure medication to raise the blood pressure, fix the problem. But we, unfortunately, in the process of rushing to fix the numbers, I like to say we miss the opportunity to make the diagnosis. And that is, I, this is my saying all the time, so I feel like I'm, I'm an echo, but I say you have to make the diagnosis. Once you have the diagnosis, you can Google the treatment. Everybody can Google the treatment. Being a doctor is making the diagnosis, not fixing the numbers. So um, I think that, um, uh, Having some cognitive unburdening, as, as you described, by helping the numbers to be processed, to be able to uh, raise alerts, allows that physician to come in. And you know, I hesitate to use the term intuition because we, in a world of evidence-based medicine, we get a little bit more and more away from the idea of the art of medicine or the, you know, the, um, the sort of creative piece to it. I think that the, the quote art of medicine isn't so much that you go with your gut or even your experience, because that's what research is supposed to be giving us, the evidence base, but that you have the time and the cognitive energy to be able to process the information, to be able to see which of your evidence-based information is applicable, um, or if there is no evidence, um, uh, sometimes it spurs some future investigation, but it can also um, give an alert. Like something's going on here, we don't even know for sure exactly if we know the right treatment for this, so now more attention has to be paid here in terms of drawing those resources. Mm -hmm. So doctor, you know, one of the interesting things is that, you know, once you start getting more evidence evidence on certain certain syndromes, certain diseases, it does have the potential to, you know, shift paradigms and change the way you diagnose a patient. You know, um, one of the things that we focus on, you know, here at the podcast, and of course in my company, is a, acute kidney injury. It's a kind of a black box disease and syndrome that no one really knows much about because technology didn't really exist to either understand it or monitor it, but that's sort of changing. And you published an interesting article that I, I've never really uh, read anything like it uh, about what you call congestive kidney failure, and more specifically how central venous pressure is a very powerful indicator of acute kidney injury in the cardiac so can, can you tell us a little bit more about that sure so um you absolutely right the kidney is so important and it's a really smart organ so it tells us well, we got two of them right <laughs> you know exactly. so that has to be important exactly right and it tells us a lot of information how patients doing in heart surgery you know realm in which i work um we're particularly interested in the kidney because um first of all if the kidney doesn't function well the fluid management in the body uh, will be dysregulated, and that can lead to heart problems, which is, of course, our main concern. And um, in, conversely, if the kidneys aren't functioning well, it might be an indication that there is a heart problem causing the, the kidneys to not uh, produce urine in their, in their usual amount, that they're not seeing enough blood flow. That's a marker that there's a perfusion problem or a blood flow problem in the body. So um, we pay a lot of attention to the kidney all the time and the urine output. Um, the, um, the concept of the congestive kidney failure is that um, you know, if, if the organ becomes congested, so if, for example, the, the pressures in the heart rise for, and it can rise for mul multiple different reasons, but if that arterial pressure, uh, sorry, great right atrial pressure becomes elevated, so that central venous pressure is elevated, that's reflected back to all the organs from the lower extremities in which would normally drain to the heart. So the, both from the um, upper extremities, upper body, as well as the lower body, the blood all drains back to the right atrium and then passes to the lungs for oxygenation. So if that um, blood, that's, uh, if that pressure, for example, is high, this is all a passive downhill flow of blood. So if that um, pressure becomes elevated on the right side of the heart, then it becomes a more a gradually uphill uh, rise for, for blood to return. And in doing so, it engorges all of the, the organs, doesn't allow them to drain normally. The kidney um, uh, pressure, um, the, the perfusion pressure, meaning the blood flow to the kidney, will be um, reduced by this back pressure, this engorgement, because the organ is not, um, is not able to empty the venous blood adequately. And that can lead to dysfunction and um, uh, decrease in urine output and decrease in clearing all of the toxins in which the kidney is responsible. So it becomes a vicious cycle because as you're not making urine, likely your fluid overload may continue to rise and that central venous pressure will even get higher. So it really creates kind of a, a, a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, 
as I say in in, um, in cardiac surgery in particular, because patients are so vulnerable for having um, heart issues, particularly related to fluid management in the perioperative period, it's um, it's something that's uh, of of a special perform- uh, importance to us. Interesting. You know, and you know, one thing that I, I was uh, read in your paper is that you found that you know so historically decreased perfusion to the kidney either either by ventricular uh, pump failure or, or vasoplegia is one of the main uh, hemodynamic determinants of AKI but you had found that uh, this is really being challenged by this concept of increased central venous, venous pressure which is becoming more of a powerful determinant uh, more, more so than arterial pressure. So why, why central venous pressure over arterial pressure? Well they're both important because certainly the organ, like any organ, needs arterial perfusion, which is how basically to think of arterial perfusion is the very, very simple goal of the entire heart and lung system, which is to bring oxygen to the cells. So mm-hmm. every cell has to, we're all, every cell is an you know, obligate aerobe, must have oxygen. So therefore, um, the arterial pressure is important because that's going to produ- you know, bring the oxygen, which allows the organ to function normally. However, um, this uh, I think some of the reason why there's increasing attention in this realm is because there's also increasing attention on the right heart itself. We used to call it the forgotten ventricle, and I think that's an, an apt name um, because the right heart is actually a remarkable thing in that the right heart is um, much more thin-walled. It's not the big powerhouse muscle like we described the left heart. The, le- the left heart gets, definitely has much better... It's got better marketing better around marketing. it. Yeah, it's better marketing on the left side. That's true, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the right heart is now getting a little... They've got a new PR agency because That's the right good. heart is starting to get some notoriety. And um, and this is sort of in that realm. So in particular, when we have patients, um, for example, after heart surgery, their right heart is a little bit more vulnerable after surgery. So um, Why is that? Well, almost all patients that have heart surgery will have a, a period where the heart is stopped. I mean, we stop all blood flow to the heart in order to be able to operate on it. It's a remarkable thing, and in fact, is really what revolutionized the ability to do heart operations, um, you know, back in the 1950s. And the um, uh, stopping of the heart, it's protective. We give a medication called cardioplegia that protects the heart, meaning it reduces the metabolism of the heart to be able to tolerate this period where there's no blood flow. However, that period of time, which we call the aortic cross clamp time, is actually the myocardial or heart muscle ischemic time. It's hmm. the time that there was no blood flow to the heart, and so the there was um, there was other medications used to reduce the need for oxygen, but there's still no presence of oxygen, and there will be some um, inevitable, um, maybe not permanent injury, but at least temporary injury. The right heart is particularly vulnerable. It's not as thick as the left heart. It's not as thick walled. So it has the, um, it, although the whole heart is cooled down, um, it doesn't have that thick internal refrigeration. So it's a little more vulnerable to warm back up to room temperature, which is warm. We try to get it below 10 degrees Celsius. The room is, you know, much warmer than that. So um, it inevitably um, uh, could warm up. And also those hot surgical lights. Um, you know, everyone knows the, the sort of movie version of the surgeon's forehead being dabbed. Um, that doesn't happen in reality. But, um, but it can be quite warm under those lights. And that the right heart is what's most anterior in the chest. So it, it may be a little more vulnerable to losing some of the benefit of the protective techniques. Mm. Um, and then the third thing is there's a lot of extra fluid in the body. Um, so there's an inflammatory response. There's a need for fluids. And, and I guess all the ECMO being done, you know, that, that has an effect as well. They mean the heart and lung machine? Yes. Yeah, because they're on the heart and lung machine during surgery, that causes an inflammatory response. They tend to need some more fluid, so then their total body um, volume goes up. Um, they may need blood transfusions or, or other factors. For and I guess that's, that's what causes the, the, the central venous hypertension. And we, exactly. And all, one thing and another, and if the ventricle is not working well, or even in a normal ventricle, if you give it enough volume, that pressure will start to go up. And then you can run into those kidney problems. The kidney also has a stress of going through surgery. We know that surgery itself is a risk factor for post-operative uh, renal um, uh, kidney injury, or post-operative acute kidney injury. And um, uh, the one of the main tax, taxes on the right heart in those first few perioperative days is that as that fluid becomes mobilized, becomes intravascular again, that may have become extravascular from the inflammatory response, that fluid starts to get pulled back into the circulation, and that right heart is, is vulnerable to not being able to keep up. And if the right heart can't pump it to the left heart, then it can't get to the kidney, and it can't be turned into urine and excreted by the body. Oh, and then this becomes this whole cascade. So 
you know that kind of segues into you know another question that I has. But but you in the paper you had mentioned that uh, that that post cardiotomy that post cardiotomy AKI is grossly grossly underestimated. It's, I'm guessing it's because of this reason that you just stated. Yeah, it's. I think it, it can. It, it um, we watch very closely to some extent, but we use traditional markers of creatinine um, to to look at kidney function. Um, there's definitely emerging evidence that there may be some biomarkers that may give us an indication sooner. Mm -hmm. However, all of, often the die has already been cast. The injury exactly. probably happened in the operating room. And what we can do, though, is avoid further fluid overload or be more aggressive of re fluid removal and be on guard for it. And when, when you're in the operating room, I mean, what, what do you look for to sort of give you an idea about how those fluids are being managed and everything? Well, we use... Um, there's, there are a variety of ways to do it. In our institution, we typically use a pulmonary artery catheter, uh, also known as a swan gans, and that catheter is, sits in the heart and gives us the continuous central venous pressure as well as the pulmonary artery pressure, so the pressures that the right heart is generating. And we also have the echo. So we, we use these things to help guide um, our fluid management so that fluid we're giving is only to the extent that we want to optimize the stroke volume, optimize the amount excuse me, amount of, of fluid that's ejected with each heartbeat, um, but not more than that, because that's likely just to add to this, um, you know, total fluid overload, which could become problematic in the days after. It's still um, a moving target. There's certainly, um, in the many different areas of medicine, we've looked at um, um, evidence, that, or sorry, um, flu, uh, goal-directed fluid administration, and that's something that we continue to attempt to do as well. Um, I think the tricky part is that with intravascular, meaning in the blood that can be ejected, can be perfusing the body, um, uh, often, um, again, due to the inflammation associated with cardiopulmonary bypass, it, um, it may not stay intravascular, may need to give additional fluid, and so it may be able to optimize it perfectly in the operating room, but it's the issue will come up in the mm. days following. And you know, in this process, I mean, where does where does urine output fit? Does that you know does that factor in? Well, that's a huge part of you know of, of kidney function as well. So the creatinine gives us uh, maybe some uh, some objective data, but the urine output um, is definitely an indicator of kidney function. Um, and that's what, one of the things I mentioned in terms of subtle trends. I think that can be really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me give you an example. Um, a pretty common post-operative complication in heart surgery is atrial fibrillation. Many patients will tolerate atrial fibrillation very well, um, and their pressure may not change or may only change subtly. Unless they have a bunch of comorbidities, right? And well, then... it, even, forget about even all the other things going on. Just looking at their heart and their blood vessels, basically. Some people will tolerate it pretty well. It, it is dependent on, on some subtle factors. But um, sometimes their blood pressure may still be okay, but they will notice that there's a big drop off in their urine output. And that tells us something. So that tells us that blood pressure is only one marker of knowing that the heart is able to produce enough blood flow. The other is how, many, how much blood flow is actually going out? Is it enough to meet the demands of the body? And so the kidney, especially um, patients that don't have pre-existing kidney disease, I would say the kidney's smart. If the kidney's not making urine, it's not making urine because it's some people, I didn't coin this term, but I do love it, which is acute kidney success, which is the kidney's not making urine. It might be because it's not seeing the blood flow for one reason or another, and therefore not making urine because it doesn't, not to anthropomorphize kidneys too much, but that it doesn't, um, it's the not. The nephrologist will appreciate it, though. <laughs> it's, not, it's not seeing. I, I, do, I do it all the time. I say, those kid, kidneys, smart, smart kidneys will tell you when there's something going on because it's not making blood flow for a reason. Um, we may use diuretics and things like that to augment it, but if the kidney doesn't respond as we'd expect to the diuretics, there's probably something happening. And it may have to do with that forward blood flow, so you may have a primary heart issue. Um, it, and atrial fibrillation could be that reason. So it may look like they're tolerating it from the perspective of their blood pressure, but were you to not be aggressive about restoring normal sinus rhythm, they may start to suffer a late kidney injury because maybe this will be a second hit from their initial um, uh, cardiac stress, the intraoperative stress. I see. And so with the urine output, does it, it seems like it's kind of a point of care uh, measurement that can indicate something's happening upstream that you need to intervene on. That's right. Do you see, I mean, I, I heard this, but I don't, I don't know how true this is, is it, can urine output be a tip off to a cardiac anesthesiologist as to how uh, healthy the cardiac output is? Then? Absolutely. 
Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, the urine output tells us a lot about the cardiac performance in general. And um, uh, in patients that are at a higher risk for acute kidney injury, it may not be a one-to-one -one, uh, analysis, it may not be low urine output, definitely means there's a heart problem. It might be a primary kidney problem. That's one of the subtleties, actually, that I think um, is important to know taking care of cardiac patients postoperatively because there are um, occasions where patients have a, a acute kidney injury that's significant from the operating room. Maybe there was a pressure reason. Um, maybe there was um, a, a, a lack of appreciation of, of how of the decreased car kidney function going in. We, again, we have sort of rudimentary numbers looking at just the creatinine. Maybe there wasn't as much kidney reserve as we thought. And so they come out with a kidney failure, or kidney injury at least, um, very early postoperatively. And um, we have to use these other monitors to distinguish, is this a heart problem or is it a primary kidney problem? And that's really important because if it turns out that there's good heart function, this is something we're actually working on studying uh, right now, but this is my personal experience. Um, if you establish that there's good heart function, um, and you therefore, uh, you know, by deductive reasoning, assume that this is a primary kidney issue. It is very important to not be afraid to give aggressive diuresis, to give aggressive diuretics to help make sure the kidney doesn't stop making urine and it makes urine enough that you can help to start bring down the CVP, which may help the recovery of the kidney, but also prevents the heart failure. So if the kidney is failing primarily and you do nothing, you will go into heart failure too. Because it's just going to back up. Because the fluid will start to be mobilized, the kidney won't be able to produce the urine, and now you'll have a second hit on the kidney, meaning you will have started with an injury from the surgery, let's assume, and now because the heart's not functioning well, the forward flow out of the heart's not good, so now the kidney is getting starved oxygen because it's not getting enough blood flow from the heart, and now that second hit is really the thing that we know causes even more kidney injury and, and predisposes to renal failure needing dialysis. So um, it's uh, when we see kidney injury, we're sometimes nervous about giving diuretics, thinking it could actually cause more harm. But in fact, in this one particular very specific case in heart surgery, we know if we don't aggressively manage fluids, we may predispose and risk um, causing a secondary heart problem, which will only injure the kidney further. That's really, really eye-opening because, you know, I, I, at least from different studies I've read, and again, I don't remember reading about this back in back in medical school, but I never realized that. Like, so just in the U.S. alone, there was a paper that showed that there's like about three hundred thousand deaths just from AK, from acute kidney injury, mm. but you're stating that a lot of times when this kidney injury happens, it backs up and it's going to end up causing heart failure. And so I wonder how many of those cases, probably thousands of them, are listed as heart failure and AKI is not even thought about because it's... Interesting question, yeah. Huh. So I, I kind of just said, you, you gave me like this <laughs> aha moment, but again, that's why we do this podcast and we love speaking to physicians like you, but so that's really interesting. Um, so for cardiac anesthesiologists, what do you think, you know, what makes a great cardiac an anesthesiologist? Because it sounds like being able to look through a jungle of data points and everything, of focusing on really specific ones that give you an idea of the physiology and tip you off, right? Um, yeah, you know, I think it's there's definitely some multitasking is definitely a, a characteristic. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot going on. As you, you mentioned, it's a dynamic, high stakes environment. So there's a lot of data coming in. There's a lot of monitors. There's the echo. There's looking at the patient. Um, so intraoperatively, there's definitely that ability to multitask. And in our postoperative critical care, I think it's similar. Um, and then I think the other big piece is teamwork, um, mm -hmm. because we do have to function in this greater team. And um, uh, I think we, um, we're really unique in that we're there from the very, very beginning to the very, very end. And um, as a result, I think that um, um, we have a real opportunity to be leaders when it comes to teamwork and um, you know, cardiac surgery. Um, the, uh, the president of one of the leading um, cardiac surgery organization said in his presidential address once that um, cardiac surgery is hard and when it's not hard it's really hard and I think that's really apt it, it, it still um, presents a lot of challenges and we often can be real leaders in keeping everyone moving in the same direction now we want to be very mindful of your time but I, I have one more thing I wanted to touch on you you have a talk coming up in the next hour a really interesting one I want to read the uh, uh, the title of it. it's it's when doctors slam the door addressing the disruptive physician in the cardiac OR. So 
What a surprise. So there's, there's like, disruptive, angry physicians in the cardiac OR? I wouldn't have guessed. Well, you know, <laughs> as an anesthesiologist, it's easy for us to throw the surgeons under the bus and say it's always the surgeons, and that's not always the case. Um, but it, it may be um, more common that uh, we get aggressive personalities on the other side of the, the drape. So why, why, why do a talk on this? Well, um, you know, we have this, this ethics panel, and um, we're really interested in some of these sort of issues that come up for us that aren't just hard science, but are, are other things that we really face. Um, the disruptive physician um, really got attention over 10 years ago. The Joint Commission made it a requirement that we address disruptive behavior and that hospitals have a process for handling it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there's a, there's sort of three things I hope I'll be able to accomplish in the talk. One is introducing the concept of disruptive physicians and how it can really indicate some serious underlying pathology that may need professional help. And so referring it may be in the best interest of the person you're referring as well as in the greater team. And the, the other um, piece of that is not everything that um, you don't like the way it was presented is necessarily meeting that same definition of, of being so detrimental. And again, this is where we can be leaders by being the first one to say, in, in maybe in another scenario, saying, hey, that didn't go as well as it could have, you know, how could we maybe handle that differently? Or let me just reflect back to you kind of how the rest of the room, you know, took, um, took your, your attitude today. And then the third thing is recognizing that we can't, uh, we have to be cautious of weaponizing these terms, that um, it's easy when you, when maybe even a subordinate, especially um, someone who's in, in a position where they didn't do the right thing, when someone else calls them out on it and, and holds them accountable, uh, we can't hide behind a code of respect and say, I didn't, I didn't like being talked to that way. Um, there's a difference between not liking the message and really an inappropriate delivery. Um, so I think we have to be mindful of, of all of these things so that we can avoid inappropriate behaviors because ultimately that can compromise patient care. And, um, you know, in the end, we're all on the same team, and that's the patient's team. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this, this uh, uh, really feeds back into your main point that, you know, there are different things that each physician can do to make themselves a great physician, but it's really about, it's a, t it's a care team, right? And so it, if, the, if the team fails, then it's going to be a failure for the patient. Absolutely. We really are only as strong as our weakest link, and we have to help each other be strong so that we can, you know, present the best care possible. Now, before we let you go, um, one, we, we, I'm sure many people are going to be curious how they can connect with you. Is there, do you have a, a, a social media handle online? I do. I'm kind of new to Twitter, so I'm more of an observer than a well, participant. Welcome to the internet. You can find me at uh, N Ivasco MD. So it's N I V A S C U M D. Perfect. And then any other any other social platforms that you that you have that's that, yeah, that you're professional. You know, <laughs> that's all that's, I have for now. Uh, but and I've just broken into social media about six months ago. Um, How does it feel? Uh, good. And I'm still a little shy, I'll admit, but, um, but I'm, I'm growing. I think I have 95 followers, so I'm probably That's pretty, great. Yeah. pretty popular. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and well, one, one last question. We do have a lot of uh, medical students and pre-medical students who listen, and, and residents, um, but any, any suggestions on, on a good book, you know, whether it's on, in leadership or medicine, but what, what's a book you often um, give to others? Well, again, I think it's obvious my passion is cardiac surgery. So I have um, two books. One is in the cardiac surgery realm, one is in general. Um, the first, it's called um, King of Hearts, and it's really about the origins. It's a story about Walter Lily High, who was a real pioneer in heart surgery. Um, it's, I like it because it's actually a lot of medical history, and it's fascinating to sort of hear how... Um, heart surgery began, it's something that you probably couldn't start today. I mean, they had deaths left and right, and they went back in the next day and tried again um, because it was a frontier that there was really nothing else to help some of these patients. So I, I think that book is actually really fascinating from um, just an evolution of medicine point of view. Um, there's another book, if you do like medical history, called Genius on the Edge, and it's the story of um, Halstead, who is a surgeon uh, known for his clamp. But... Um, <laughs> but um, it also uh, takes place in, um, uh, I guess, early 1900s in New York City. So I, I feel like the New York City history mixed in with uh, with me early medical schools, and there's just like one or two medical schools. It's it's a pretty good uh, book as well. Very cool. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking time to uh, sit and speak with us, and really looking forward to checking out your talk. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Great.
Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Hills and Valleys. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on our podcast, that way you're notified of new episodes as they're released. And if you're not already, please go ahead and follow Potrero Medical on all our social platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And we'll see you next time.